sort of Chatterjee telling us about uh, a quark confinement. I don't know what level your talk will be at, so let me just advertise on your behalf that actually uh, Sor has written a great uh, sort of uh, survey about such things and actually uh, has uh, lecture notes from a course, I don't know if I to get now when you taught it, but they're quite uh, nice lecture notes on like an introduction to quantum field theory for, for mathematicians. Uh, so yeah, so if, if, if your interest is piqued, uh, there are some good resources to look at. Uh, so without further ado, yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks James. Uh, okay, thanks uh, for the invitation to the organizers. And, uh, you know, unfortunately you know, I'm teaching two classes this quarter and, you know, it's just taking up all my time. So I just took a break from teaching to give this lecture. It's just in the slot when I have no, no teaching. Um, so, um, okay. So uh, let me get into it right away. Um, a quantum gauge theory is also known as this quantum Yang Mills theories are uh, components of the standard model of quantum mechanics. So that's the best uh, predictive model of the quantum universe as of now. Um, and uh, uh, so the unfortunate thing is that, um, you know, there has been a lot of research on this to construct quantum gauge theories or quantum, quantum Yang Mills theories. And uh, physically relevant theories have not yet been constructed. The ones that actually apply to real particles uh, have not yet been constructed. So there have been some constructions, you know, these five four theories in three dimensions, you know, there are some constructions, but, um, but the ones that uh, uh, are really um, important for, uh, for, uh, for physics have not yet been constructed. Um, so the most popular approach to solving this, uh, this question is by this program of constructive field theory, which um, uh, was very active in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and, and you know, still the, it's, uh, you know, it's active. Um, so in this approach, what one starts with is um, a statistical mechanics model on the lattice. And then um, uh, the next step is to pass to a continuum limit of this model. So you know, in probability, we all know what that could potentially mean, you know, pass to a continuum limit of this model. A third step is to show that this continuum limit satisfies certain axioms. Uh, you know, it's called axioms. It, I mean, it's basically properties, a bunch of properties they have to satisfy, um, such as reflection positivity and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so there are various different sets of axioms. And um, if any one of these set of axioms is satisfied, then there is a standard machine that allows the construction of a quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is an operator value distribution. Okay, so that's the formal you know, if you, if you ask somebody, what, what is a quantum field? There's an operator value distribution. So it's sort of some object defined on some space where which if you integrate over a region, you get an operator instead of a number, okay? Uh, and so starting from a continuum limit of this, of a, of a statistical mechanics model, which is typically, you know, a, a, a regular, you know, distribution in the sense of, you know, Schwartz distribution maybe. Uh, from that, how do you get an operator value distribution? There is a standard machine for that and one can do that. The, the most difficult step is usually to construct this um, continuum limit of the statistical mechanics model. So, so in that sense, these are mostly these are probability questions. So that's uh, the fascinating thing for a, for a probabilist that these are probability questions. And so taking this program to its completion is one of the clay millennium problems as, uh, as you know. Um, so the statistical mechanics models that are uh, really relevant in, in physics in the standard model are known as lattice gauge theories, because these are the ones that are really the ones that are uh, the important ones. Uh, a lattice gauge theory may be coupled with a Higgs field or it may be a pure lattice gauge theory. So there are additional complications if you couple it with the Higgs field. So we, we will not talk about that. We'll deal with only pure lattice gauge theories in this talk. Um, a pure lattice gauge theory has three uh, uh, components. So one is its gauge group, usually uh, a compact matrix Lie group. So sometimes mathematicians use gauge group to mean something else, but here you know, it's just the group associated with the, with the, with the theory. Um, it's a compact matrix Lie group and the dimension of space time, which the most important case is four uh, and a parameter known as the coupling strength. Okay, so that's for pure lattice gauge theories. And if you couple it to Higgs field, there are some more parameters. So these theories on their own, even without passing to this limit, um, can yield substantial physical information. So there are actually you know, huge supercomputers running simulations for these theories. So these are statistical mechanics models. So presumably you can simulate from them using a Gibbs sampler, you know, something like that. And people are doing that. So there is a, a and what they want is to, is to predict the masses of elementary particles. And then in cases where 
the masses can actually be measured, they, they want to match those. And even with lattice gauge theories, they measure, they predict and they measure, and it's you know usually 90% accuracy that they, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's 90% accuracy they can get these numbers. So there are, there are big, big programs running this, uh, running these things. So there is this general field called lattice QCD, which you can look up. Um, so, so there are very, you know, there are many important questions about lattice gauge theories and two um, very important questions have uh, lattice gauge the theoretic formulations. The first is the question of yang mills mass gap. Uh, so in, um, you know, mass gap for a quantum field theory means basically a gap in the spectrum of the, of the Hamiltonian considered as an operator. But, you know, if we just boil down the whole thing to lattice gauge theories, what it uh, turns out to be is that mass gap is the same as um, equivalent to exponential degree of correlation. So, so this is a kind of subtle point. This certain kind of boundary conditions. So we'll come to that later. It's usually not stated in this way. People just say mass gap means exponential degree of correlations. Okay, um, and uh, it's not hard to establish at sufficiently large values of the coupling strength, which means at high temperature. So, as uh, you know, probably most of you know that. Uh, if you have some kind of um, Markov random field, uh, Gibbs uh, uh, distribution, then uh, if, if beta is small enough, it's not hard to establish um, uh, exponential degree of correlation. There are standard machines to do that. Uh, now, the theory is a physical relevant only at weak coupling. So that's a problem. Okay, so um, nothing comes for free. So you can do it at strong coupling, but the main uh, physical, re physical relevant regime is a weak coupling which is the large beta uh, corresponds to a large beta in statistical mechanics. Um, so it's not known how to mathematically establish mass gap in 4D or 3D lattice gauge theories at weak coupling. And, uh, but there are huge Monte Carlo studies and they show we, beyond doubt that these are, these are correct. So the people believe that. So I'll give you precise, um, you know, conjectures, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is expected later on. The second question is a question of quark confinement. Uh, so quarks are the constituents of various elementary particles such as protons and neutrons. A proton is made up of a number of quarks. And, uh, and so the quarks are never observed freely in nature. So, uh, so you, they never come out, somehow come out of being uh, bound to each other. So uh, you know, quark, anti-quark pairs are bound. Um, so it's not clear you know, why this is the case. So, so this is, you know, should be, you know, if the standard model is correct, it should be uh, possible to deduce this from the standard model. But the problem is that all the physics mm, that is done, the theoretical physics that is done with the standard model is mostly all perturbative. So, but to understand quark confinement, you really have to understand you know, things non-perturbatively. And the series expansions that they have, you know, they, those things don't converge. And so, so that's the that's big roadblock. Why quark confinement has not yet been understood is that you really need to understand these lattice gauge theories in a non-perturbative non way. Okay. And uh, so, so the consensus seems to be that a satisfactory explanation doesn't exist, although there are some explanations. Um, so why, um, so where do you start? So I'll, I'll introduce lattice gauge theories soon. Uh, so what Wilson, uh, one of the pioneers in this area, suggested that uh, quark confinement is equivalent to showing that the relevant lattice gauge theory satisfies what's known as Wilson's area law. And a number of deep results are known, so I'll discuss those, um, but the main questions are all um, uh, are, 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 are open. So can I ask a, a high level question? Uh, quark confinement is what, is that, this is very. This is a, like a physics question, but that's what's responsible for the 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 fact that the, the the strong nuclear force doesn't satisfy like an inverse squ uh, square law, like yeah, electricity yeah. and gravity and so on. Yeah. So so it, it is all about the strong force. So the strong force is the thing that uh, causes this confinement, and you know why why does that happen? So that's not. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it's, it's believed that uh, the, the potential, so I'll, I'll come to that. So the potential between two quarks separated by a distance r actually grows linearly in r. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, that's why they cannot separate beyond a certain distance. So, so the force remains constant. So as the quarks move away, the force doesn't decrease. Um, okay, so, uh, so the main result, uh, so I've not introduced the mathematical model till now. So I'll just give you the broad overview and then, then I'll give you the precise statement later on. The main result is that if the gauge group is compact, connected, and has a non-trivial center, 
then the presence of exponential decay of correlations under arbitrary boundary conditions implies Wilson's area law. So in some sense, you can say that mass gap implies confinement in some broad sense. Um, so, so the non-triviality of the center is known as center symmetry. And this, is, this has been conjectured in physics for a very long time that center symmetry, this non-trivial center is very important. So there are, you know, SO3 lattice gauge, if the group is SO3, for instance, which has a trivial center, then it's not supposed to be confining. And this is the first result, which kind of gives a rigorous justification for that, that why this non-trivial center may be important. And um, so, so this was a slightly confusing thing uh, in the beginning. So, so, this, so this is, I call it strong mass gap, uh, this exponential decay holding under arbitrary boundary conditions. So, um, so, okay, so let me get to that. So there's a long-standing belief in, in physics uh, originating in this work, work of Tooth that mass gap plus unbroken center symmetry implies confinement. So this is what the physicists believe, mass gap plus unbroken center symmetry. And now unbroken center symmetry is not rigorously defined. So there are some definitions in physics which are kind of complicated, so I'll not go into that. But it's not a rigorously defined concept, this unbroken center symmetry. Now, so when I, when I first, uh, you know, circulated my paper, um, uh, you know, the physicist, uh, Ed Witten and uh, Steve Schenker here, so they were a little confused because, uh, you know, there are some models which are known to have mass gap, but still um, don't, are not supposed to be confining, okay? So what's, what's going on here? Uh, on the other hand, you know, SU3, you know, theory, this theory of the strong force is supposed to have mass gap at all, all beta. And so, uh, you know, so, so what it turn, turned out is that um, mass gap means exponential decay, as it is commonly said, but it's only under a specific kind of boundary condition that's dictated by the Feynman path integral of the theory. And so this is, uh, you know, what... Um, uh, so finally, you know, uh, from Ed Witten, you know, that's that's what what he thinks. So that uh, uh, the strong mass gap is this the strengthening of this condition that it's hold under arbitrary boundary conditions. It's it's what prevents the breaking of center symmetry. Okay, and okay, so so there is you know okay there is all this uh, thing about that, but uh, th this is the this is the precise result. I mean, as precise as it can be without presenting the model that if you have exponential leak of correlations under arbitrary boundary conditions then um, the uh, Wilson's area law will hold. And that is kind of surprising because, you know, uh, okay, so, I, well, why is surprising? I have to de define the model, but um, yeah, so, um, okay. So this is uh, roughly the content of this talk and, and then I'll go into the definition, rigorous definition of the, of the model. Is the strong mass gap a reasonable assumption? I mean, in, in the sense that it's sort of expected to hold so um, the thing is, you know, we have very little understanding of decay of correlations in this model. So, for example, in SU3 lattice gauge theory, it is believed that exponential decay of correlations should hold in four dimensions, should hold at all beta. Okay. But we don't even know how to prove any kind of decay of correlations at large beta, let alone, let alone exponential decay of correlations. So, so that's, that's beyond the proof. And so... It's not clear whether, uh, you know, whether the original mass gap assumption, you know, that if, if exponential leak of correlations, all be, whether that is true, well, that is also an assumption. Uh, but, you know, I've heard from people that, uh, um, that is believed that at all beta, you have unique Gibbs, you have a unique Gibbs state, uh, you know, for SU3 theory, for non-abelian theories, that you have unique Gibbs state. And so it is not you know, it is possible that it holds, uh, you know, if, if, if exponential decay holds, then it's possible that it holds. In the theories where it doesn't hold under all boundary conditions, but it holds under some boundary conditions. So there are some theories known like that. So those are discrete, you know, Z2 theory, for instance, when the gauge group is, is finite, finite abelian gauge group. So there are some results which say that, uh, you know, there, there is non-uniqueness of, the, but th then there is non-uniqueness of the Gibbs state. And, uh, so if it is unique, so then one can expect. So it's not clear. It's not clear. But but what this certainly shows is that in the full regime, where you have exponential decay of correlations uh, under this arbitrary boundary conditions, and so in in some sense in the full high temperature regime, and in SU three, it's believed to extend to the full uh, full real uh, positive axis. Um, you know, you you have this, you have Wilson's area, uh, area law. So that's you know that's that's all I can say about that. Um, so we'll see. So uh, so here's the notation. Uh, let n and d be two integers. 
uh, and uh, let G be a com close connected subgroup of the unitary group UN. Okay, so just um, you can be more general than that, but I'm restricting myself to that. Let BN be a large box in ZD. Okay, let EN be the set of positively oriented nearest neighbor edges of BN. Okay, so you have this large box and you have this positively oriented edges. Let omega in the set of all functions from EN into G, so that is you're attaching a group element to each positively oriented edge. And then for a negatively oriented edge, you just define the matrix attached to that to be the inverse of the matrix attached to the positively oriented edge. So you just, um, that's, that's the convention. That is, if you attach a matrix to an edge E, then in the opposite orientation, you attach the matrix E, uh, uh, the inverse of that, that matrix. Okay, so that's, that's how you assign matrices to edges. Okay. Now a plaquette is a set of four directed, ed directed edges that form the boundary for square. And let PN be the set of all plaquettes in this large box. Okay. Now, given some plaquette P and some configuration, define omega P as follows. So you take, you write the plaquette as a sequence of edges like this, going in some direction. So E1, E2, E3, E4. And define omega P to be the product of these. Okay. So now there is some ambiguity here about the choice of E1, which is the first edge and in which direction will you go. But we'll, we'll just need the quantity, the real part of the trace of omega p, and this will not be affected by these choices. So this is fine. Okay. So you have just these, uh, so, so you have uh, matrices attached to edges, and from that you get matrices attached to plaquettes. Okay. So the plaquettes are always two-dimensional, uh, even though the space may be uh, you know, higher than two-dimensional. So you have these plaquettes. And now we define the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian comes in terms of these omega p's, okay, the real part of the trace of omega p. So let del en denote the set of positively oriented boundary edges, and let del omega n be the set of all assignments of matrices to these boundary edges. So that's uh, these are this is a set of boundary conditions. And then you have interior edges, and then you have uh, assignments to interior edges. So you fix the boundary condition, and then you have um, freedom inside, okay? And then what you do is you take a boundary condition and take a configuration of uh, matrices attached to the interior edges and extend it to the full boundary by just defining it to be equal to the boundary condition outside. But anyway, you know, this is all just technical. So this is the main thing. The Hamiltonian is a, is a sum over all plaquettes of the real part of the trace of, of omega p. So for each plaquette, you're multiplying these matrices, okay? And then you're taking the real part of the trace and taking the sum. And Hamiltonian sense of, uh, you know, I, I should put a minus here, but yeah, I'll not put a minus, so it'll be minus and the other minus will cancel. So, so, the, so the measure will be in the next slide, e to the, e to the beta times h, okay? So, uh, so when is this real part of trace maximized? So these, remember, these are unitary matrices. So these omega e's are unitary matrices, their products are also unitary matrices. So the real part of the trace of a unitary matrix is maximized when it, the matrix is the identity. So if beta is large, what, so this, this thing will be large when the omegas are all close to identity, okay? And that is a lot of configuration. So that's not, uh, you know, not like in the Ising model that you just have two configurations, okay? Okay, so the pure lattice gauge theory on this big box with gauge group G, coupling parameter beta, boundary condition delta is this probability measure. Sorry, you know, it's a lot of notation, but, uh, uh, you know, just bear with me and, uh, uh, you know, just you know, un unmute and ask if you have a question because I cannot see the chat messages. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's proportional to this density times the product Hall measure, okay? So again, to just to repeat, you have this big box in the lattice. On each edge, you have a matrix. You have a unitary matrix from some group, okay? Subgroup of the unitary matrix. So, uh, so you have an element from that. And then for each plaquette, which is a you know, little square of edges, you multiply the matrices along the edges and take the real part of the trace of that, sum up over all the, all, all the plaquettes, and that's your Hamiltonian. So you put that e to the beta times that in front of the product Haar measure, okay? And that gives you the lattice gauge theory. So that's the definition of lattice gauge theory, pure lattice gauge theory without a Higgs field, okay? So here beta is the coupling parameter. So beta is one over G zero squared, G zero is called the coupling strength. 
And then you define, as usual, you define the expectation of a function with respect to this lattice gauge theory in the usual way, the angle bracket notation, the integral of f with respect to this, uh, this measure. And you know, we are also putting a boundary condition uh, there. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so the area law. Uh, let pi be a finite dimensional unitary representation of the group. Okay, so we have a subgroup, we have a compact Lie group. So um, the, we can consider finite dimensional unitary representations and chi be the character of pi. So you take the trace of a pi applied to an element. Let L be a closed loop in this box with directed edges E1 through Ek. And given a configuration omega, the Wilson move variable WL omega is defined as uh, this chi of pi, this character applied to this product, uh, omega E1, omega E2, up to omega Ek. So you are you're looking at directed edges. So you multiply along the, in the proper direction. Um, and again, um, since we are taking the trace, uh, it doesn't matter which edge is chosen to be E1. Okay. So as long as the direction is correct, it, does, it doesn't matter which edge is chosen to be E1. And the lattice gauge theory is satisfied to, uh, said to satisfy uh, Wilson's area law for this representation pi if, the, if it satisfies this, that uh, uh, the, um, you know, the, the Wilson loop expectation, so this is called the expected Wilson loop expectation for this loop L. The Wilson loop expectation in absolute value is bounded by C1 times E to the minus C2 times the area enclosed by L for any rectangular loop. So if you take a rectangular loop, just a rectangle, uh, the area enclosed by that is just its length times its breadth. But you know, if you have more complicated loops, in, particularly in high dimensions, then you, it's, it's interpreted to be the minimum surface area enclosed by the loop in some sense. Uh, but I'm not going to that, so just I'm restrict myself to rectangle loops. Uh, where C1 and C2 are positive constant that, de that depend on the group, the coupling parameter, the dimension, and the representation pi, but uh, not on the on Bn, on, on not on this n here. Because we are we want to take eventually want to take n to infinity and we have an infinite volume measure, and this thing should hold for the infinite volume measure also. Okay. So that's that's called Wilson's area law. And okay, so here is where uh, what I mentioned some time ago that it's surprising that uh, one can expect this because you know you're multiplying these matrices along the loop, and if you have decay of correlations, you expect that uh, you know it should be something e to the minus the perimeter, okay? Uh, because you're multiplying a number of things which become more and more independent as you go go far away. So so why do we have the area instead, okay? Which is much bigger than than the perimeter. So uh, so that's that's the mysterious thing about the area law. Why it's um, so I don't know how Wilson conjectured that this would be the case, but um, you know, so that's the so that's the surprising thing. Okay. All right. So let me now go into what's known about the well. First, why does it imply confinement? So um, so just a very brief. Uh, idea about that. So let Vr be the potential energy of a static quark anti quark pair separated by distance r. And if uh, computations from quantum field theory indicate that um, if you have a rectangular loop of side lengths r and t in the continuum limit of four dimensional SU3 gauge theory, so SU3 is the lattice gauge theory that corresponds to the strong force and suitable representation pi, then this Wilson loop expectation should behave like e to the minus vr times t, where vr is this potential. So if the area law holds, then vr should grow linearly in r. So the, so the derivative of vr, which is the force, remains constant. And by conservation of energy, this means that the pair will not be able to separate beyond a certain distance, the energy that it starts out with. So it will never be able to separate beyond that on, on, on its own. Okay. So, um, so now renormalization group arguments predict that this beta has to be sent to infinity as the lattice spacing goes to zero when you take the continuum limit. So this is, again, this is highly non-trivial and it comes from, from renormalization group that this uh, should happen to take. So, so you, you do not keep beta fixed and take the continuum limit. Uh, you have to, as, you, as the lattice spacing goes to zero, you also have to take beta to infinity like in four dimensions, like the logarithm of the lattice spacing. So that's some, some actually some precise multiple of the logarithm of the lattice spacing. Uh, so that's uh, what, is, uh, what is theorized. And, um, and so 
to uh, so so in the first step to prove it in lattice in lattice gauge theories, you have to prove it for large beta. Okay, so that's that's the thing that you have to somehow prove it for large beta. You know, small beta is not going to imply confinement of quarks, and there is much stronger reason to for that. You know, I'll, I'll come to that in a couple of slides. Okay. Okay, so, so there are some basic facts. So I'll, I'll just survey, very briefly survey the results that are known about the area law. And most of these are pretty old results in you know, 40 years old. So if, can uh, you, is there some toy model where I would, you know, I would be able to see exponential decay in the area, sort of? Yeah, I'm coming to that. So I'm, okay. I'm coming to that soon. Uh, so, okay. So, so it's easy to show, first of all, that the area law holds at all beta in any two-dimensional theory. So, so it, the two-dimensional is particularly easy because two-dimensional lattice gauge theories can be reduced to one-dimensional problems by a process known as gauge fixing. And as soon as you go to one dimension, you know, it, everything becomes very manageable uh, and you can do that. So that's not, that's not hard. Um, so that's one result. Uh, Zeiler in 1978 proved that an area law lower bound holds for any theory at any beta, essentially any theory at any beta. So, so area law is the best you can hope for, uh, you know, if you look at lattice gauge theories. On the other hand, Simon and Yaffe uh, proved that a perimeter law upper, bounds hold, uh, upper bound holds for any theory at any beta. And that, again, uh, you know, uh, is not so hard, uh, especially with probabilistic arguments. Uh, it's not, not very hard to establish that. Uh, that a perimeter law upper bound holds for any theory at any beta. And it's basically because you're multiplying a large number of unitary matrices, and each of them has a little bit of freedom given everything else, even given everything else. So this little bit of freedom is going to accumulate, and you're going to get an exponential decay in the perimeter. Okay, okay so there are some deeper results. So the first is this um, uh, well-known result of Oster, Walder, and Zeiler, who showed that the area law holds at small beta for any theory in any dimension. So given a theory, there is a small enough threshold beta zero, so that if beta is less than beta zero, then uh, the area law holds for rectangles. So they proved it for rectangles, that the area law holds. And this is, uh, is not an easy result. You know, it uses these uh, expansions and then it uses um, quite a bit of uh, representation theory and all that. Okay, so here is the very, um, you know, interesting thing about the area law is that in four-dimensional U1 theory, so okay, so this result was, you know, somewhat disconcerting because, you know, U1 gauge theory is supposed to describe electromagnetism, which is, you know, theory of photons and electrons. So, so photons are certainly not bound, okay, so, they, so there is no confinement of photons. So it was not clear that if, you know, uh, you know, if if um, if the area law holds that small beta for any theory, including U1 theory, you know, how is this possible? Because U1 is supposed to describe photons. And, you know, this was rigorously proved, but Fields has realized this um, soon after Wilson's work that the area law uh, should hold that small beta for essentially any theory. Um, and so what uh, Alan Guth and Froelich and Spencer they showed is that for four, dimension, four dimensional U1 theory, the area law actually breaks down at large beta and, and instead of perimeter law holds. So this is known as deconfinement transition. And this is exactly what should happen because in four dimensional U1 theory, you don't expect, uh, uh, don't expect uh, the area law. And not, and not even area law, anything worse than the perimeter law or maybe anything better than the perimeter law cannot hold because you know, VR, if, if the perimeter law holds, then you know, VR is essentially constant. Uh, the potential is constant. And, so, um, so this is called a deconfinement transition. And this was physically expected because four dimensional theory is related to photons, which are not confined. However, in three dimensions, it was shown, and this is also a very uh, you know, deep and difficult paper, uh, that the area law holds at all beta in three dimensional U1 theory. So unlike in four dimension, three dimension, even U1 theory is confining. And uh, this is still the only non-trivial case where uh, area law has been established at, at large beta. There are some other results. Uh, Froelich showed that confinement holds in, a, holds in a SUN theory if and only if, uh, well, if it holds it, the corresponding ZN theory. Um, there are other results which connect confinement in d-dimensional lattice gauge theories with, uh, with exponential degree of correlations with d minus one dimensional nonlinear sigma models. And uh, then there are other ex uh, examinations of uh, these things in, at non-zero temperature. So you can also add a different parameter called temperature, not, not beta. 
Uh, and uh, to answer James's question, uh, there's a toy model for exhibiting a sharp transition from the confining to the de confining regime was studied in this paper of Eisenman, J. Chills, Froelich, and Russo. Uh, so there, is, there are some toy models which are not lattice gauge theories, which, which are somewhat simpler than lattice gauge theories where things are more, more manageable. So there are some things like that. Um, Recently, you know, there have been some things. So this, uh, you know, area large, large at small beta for arbitrary loops, where area is the area is a minimum surface area. This was established in large and limit of this theories in some papers that I wrote, and also with my student Jafar Jafarov. Um, and uh, and then I have been trying to figure out the exact leading order behavior of the of the constants in the exponents. So in a very very simple case, this four dimensional Z two theory, I could do that. Uh, recently, and this result was extended uh, to 40 theories with finite abelian groups in this paper and with general finite groups, uh, uh, you know, uh, by my student Sky Kao um, in this very nice paper. Uh, so, uh, so this has been some development, but as you can see uh, that the question about uh, four-dimensional SU3 theory, which is the most important of lattice gauge theories, um, the area law is supposed to hold at all beta, but uh, has not been proven, and that's the that's the main thing. So the main open question is to uh, prove the area law for uh, four D S U three theory at arbitrary large values of beta. Uh, but however, you know, proving it for any other four dimensional non abelian theory would be would be very very interesting. Okay, not only S U three theory. Uh, it's not supposed to hold for four D abelian theories at large beta uh, or with even non-abelian theories with finite gauge groups, unfortunately. So even if you have finite gauge groups, so it, you have to have a four dimensional, uh, you know, uh, you have to have a theory with a gauge group, which is uh, both non-abelian and, uh, you know, it's basically, it has to be a compact Lie group. So, um, so that's, that's what it has to be. Okay, so now let me come to the main result that I'm going to state. Uh, so here's the center symmetry assumption. So assume that the center of G is non-trivial and there is uh, in the sense that uh, well, it's non-trivial and there is an element G0 in the center so that this representation pi applied to G0 is also non-trivial, like C times the identity where C is not equal to one. So C has to be a complex number of modulus one, but it's not equal to one. So there is a non-triviality of the center. And the strong mass cap assumption precisely says the following. So say that two edges are neighbors if they both belong to some common plaquette and say that a measurable map f from this space of configurations in real lines, the local function supported on edge if the value of the function depends only on the values of the matrices that are neighbors of, uh, supported on edges that are neighbors of a, of a given edge. And so let's say you have two local functions like this and the distance between them is defined as a distance, Euclidean distance between the midpoints of the supporting edges for some definition of distance. So then the assumption is that there are positive constants k1 and k2 depending only on the gauge group, the coupling parameter and the dimension, and not on the size of the box that you're taking or the boundary condition, such that for any two local functions, the correlation, the truncated correlation um, is bounded by k1 times e to the minus k2 times the distance between the two functions, you know, the supports of the two functions, okay? So that's the strong mass cap assumption that I'm making. And, and let me just tell you, this is, true if beta is small enough. That is not hard to show that this is true if beta is small enough, okay? So that's one situation, but, but then I'm not assuming beta is small, I'm just assuming that this decay condition holds, okay? And so then the theorem is that uh, let G be a compact connected subgroup of UN for some N and let pi be a finite dimensional unitary representation of G. Take any dimension D and any beta and consider the lattice gauge theory on this uh, large cube, BN, Suppose that the center symmetry and strong, strong mass gap assumptions are satisfied. So then there are positive constants uh, so that, uh, well, any loop that's sufficiently away from the boundary, uh, the uh, Wilson's area law is, any rectangular loop, um, the, the Wilson's area law is satisfied. Uh, and moreover, there is a unique infinite volume Gibbs state you can deduce from these conditions, the strong mass gap condition. Uh, and um, this, uh, this bound holds for any rectangular lip, uh, loop L if the expectation on the left is taken to respect to this infinite volume. So, you, you know, this is slightly messier if you state it in a finite box, so you can, for aesthetic reasons, you can just go to the infinite volume and you can show this unique in, infinite volume gives state and, uh, and this, uh, this, uh, this holds. Okay, so 
So that's the main statement. Any questions? Okay, so this uh, this says that um, uh, you know from exponential leak of correlations, this particular version of exponential leak of correlations, you can you can deduce the area law. Just and the argument is fully probabilistic, so it doesn't involve um, the representation theory or, uh, or other other ingredients. The fully probabilistic argument. Okay, so some remarks. Um, this this mass strong mass gap is stronger than usual mass gap because uh, the usual mass gap means exponentially can under a specific kind of boundary condition, uh, and this is satisfied. The strong mass gap assumption is satisfied by any lattice gauge theory if beta is small enough. So this uh, this so that's the result that I showed implies this old result of Oster, Walder, and Seiler, but it says more, um, and. Uh, so it is not clear, you know, coming back to James's question, the strong mass gap assumption holds that all beta in four dimensional non-abelian theories as conjectured for usual mass gap, but it's not impossible. And uh, and if this is proved, that will solve the confinement problem. And well, if this is proved to be wrong, that would be very interesting too. You know, if you have, you know, uh, if you have a phase transition, because we have no information about any kind of phase transition in, uh, in non-abelian four dimensional theories. So. Um, so if this is not true, then there'll be a, it will have some kind of phase transition, at least a costly stylus transition. Okay, and that would be extremely interesting too. And so this is the first rigorous result that throws light on this role of roles of mass gap and center symmetry in confinement. So these are well established in the physics discourse. So they they say that these, they, although you know there is actually no completely accepted argument about uh, confinement, uh, but they you know the, all these heuristics. Um, I mean, even in the physics sense, uh, not, uh, yeah, and uh, and so uh, so there are these heuristics which say that if you have mass gap and unbroken center symmetry, then you will have confinement. So this is uh, sort of the first result that gives some kind of rigorous justification of that. Okay. Okay. So let me go into the proof sketch. Uh, how do you how do you prove? Uh, Okay, so it's really hard uh, in uh, in a uh, in a Zoom talk, but let let me try. Is center symmetry some kind of coercivity condition? And... Uh, so can you can you say a bit more about that? I... Yeah, so there's something in the group that's attractive in some sense. I mean, in terms of phase, I mean. I just the math, the exponential decay makes sense. The center symmetry, I'm, is, I have no intuition. Yeah, so it comes from the proof somehow. So I, I have no intuition either. So I'll show you the step in the proof where, where center symmetry is used. And they think that without center symmetry, like as I said, SO3 lattice gauge theory, even in four dimensions, SO3 lattice gauge theory is supposed to not be confining at large beta. That's what they say. And uh, because it has a trivial center and uh, and so I, I don't know. So um, so let's see in the in the proof. So we'll we'll see where it comes from. So you have this R D D dimension, and the first, let the first coordinate denote time, and the d minus one remaining coordinates denote space. Uh, let L be a rectangular loop with side lengths r and t, where the sides of length t are parallel to the time axis. So this side t is going up. So you imagine like that, and uh, and then you have r, which is the width. Okay. So we wish to show that the Wilson loop expectation is bounded by C1 times C to the minus C2 times R times T, okay, for this loop, as we multiply the matrices along the edges of the loop, okay. So it's not very difficult to prove the perimeter of the upper bound that is bounded by C1 times E to the minus C2 times R plus T. So combined with this information, it suffice, suffices to prove that, um, it's a small argument, it suffices to prove that instead of this bound, uh, the area law bound, you can prove this, you know, so you, you have something a little bit worse looking. There's a positive C2 times R plus T in front of the minus C3 times RT, but you know, this is, this is fine. If you prove this, then, uh, then together with the perimeter law upper bound, uh, the, this result will follow. So you have this loop L and you have this edges going along L and if this matrices omega E, each is a unitary matrix attached to these edges. And then you apply this pi, which is the representation, which gives you again unitary, unitary matrices. So pi omega E are unitary matrices attached to edges. And let, uh, so you, what you do is you take one element from each matrix, okay? Just some arbitrary element, one element from each matrix and take the product of these elements. Let F be the product. 
So we'll call such a variable a component variable for L. So this Wilson loop variable, uh, Wilson loop variable WL is the trace of the product of these matrices. So, so therefore, uh, it's a sum of a large number of component variables. The number is some constant to the power R plus T. M is a dimension which is fixed. So some constant times R plus, uh, to the power R plus T of these component variables. So it suffices to prove that any component variable ha satisfies this bound because then we just have to multiply it by some something to raise, raise to the power R plus T. Okay. And that's, that's fine. So you can reduce it, this kind of non-abelian matrix product, you know, you can reduce it just to products of scalars. Okay. No problem. Okay, so, so now what you do is you partition space-time into slabs of thickness L in the time direction. So this is the time direction. So you have slabs of thickness L. So here's a picture. Um, so let R be the it'd be T over L, that's the number of slabs. R is the number of slabs. Uh, so then, so the, here is your loop. The thickened line is the loop, okay? Uh, width R uh, height T. A component variable where you take one element from each matrix and you multiply, multiply those together um, can be written as follows. So there is a component that comes from the bottom line here, which you call U. There is something that comes from the top, which you call V. You don't worry about those. And there are things that come from the sides. There are contributions that come from the sides, F1, F2, F3, F4, and then G1, G2, G3, G4. These are the components. And so the total Overall, the variable is a product of all of these things. So these are the total components coming from these parts. Is that clear? Okay. So now let omega be a random configuration from this lattice gauge theory. Let mu prime be the conditional probability given the configuration for all these that belong to the boundary between slabs. So what I'm doing here, I condition on the boundaries between the slabs, okay? So once you condition, uh, let angle F uh, prime denote the expected value of F under this conditional probability so that the overall expectation is the expectation of this conditional expectation. So it suffices to prove the area law for this conditional expectation inside, instead. Okay. So under this conditional measure, the nice thing is that the omegas in the slabs, uh, inside one slab are independent of omegas inside another slab. So this is the Gibbs property of the of lattice gauge theory. It becomes the slabs become independent once you condition on the boundaries. So you get this identity that F prime, uh, the conditional expectation is U times V. So U and V, just going back, U and V are in the slabs, uh, in the boundaries. So they become constants once you, once you condition. So, and then you have F1, G1 prime, F2, G2 prime, and so on. So, so F1 and G1 are not independent. See, F1 and G1 are not independent, but they're independent of F2 and G2, okay? So, so when you have this product, you have this, uh, this identity, okay? So, so to show that this is bounded by this, it suffices to show that each of these little components, F1 times G1 prime is bounded by E to the minus R, because then you'll be taking the product of these things and the number of slabs is a multiple of T. And so if L is a fixed width, so it's very important, we'll take L to be a fixed width slab. So it's not going to infinity as T and R go to infinity. So, so we have a fixed width slab. So therefore, uh, if we can prove this kind of a bound, then, then we are done. So this is what we want to show. That is the contribution coming from uh, the right half and the left half within a slab. If you multiply them, the expectation is decaying, uh, you know, like e to the minus r, the distance between them. Okay. All right. Any questions till now? Okay, so you, you have this. So now here's the non-trivial center. Um, so what happens is that because of the non-trivial center, yeah, James. So in the, like, in, at least, I mean, in, in uh, so what you've traded here, I mean, you have this local exponential decay condition on for edges, and now this is an exponential decay uh, exponential decay for not for edges but for these uh, squares bounding the two sides, which are, I guess, have one of the dimensions it's constant, and you know ba basically you've removed one dimension and you're just and you're trying to prove just exponential decay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the idea that will come later on is that the exponential decay in the full model will imply exponential decay in a thick enough slab. 
So you can, you can take a thick slab, you know, if L is large enough, larger than some constant, you can still have exponential decay within the slab. So that, that's the main part of the proof. So now, uh, assuming that, suppose you can prove that, uh, then what happens is that the non-trivial center forces this thing. Even after conditioning, the expectations of these, conditional expectations of these FIs and GIs will be zero. So this does not hold if you don't have a non-trivial center. The non-trivial center, together with the structure of lattice gauge theory, ensures that even after conditioning on the top and bottom slab, uh, boundaries of a slab, you have the contributions from the two strands of the loop that goes in, uh, they, they have expectation zero. So, so to prove, so we can replace this Fi Gi prime by this truncated correlation. Okay. So, so, so once you have the truncated correlation uh, decays exponentially within the slab, and you have non-trivial center, which ensures this irrespective of the conditioning, then, then it, it, it works out. So, so this will follow if you can show correlations decay exponentially within each slab for any given boundary condition on the slab, okay? So the key idea is to hold, show that this holds that the thickness of the slab is chosen to be sufficiently large. Okay, so how do we show this? So you take a large but finite slab, uh, minus n, n, n is fixed, and think of m as very big, uh, times m minus m, m to the d minus one. The set of all boundary edges that do not belong to either the top or the bottom face will be called a special boundary. So that's a small boundary that's surrounding the slab. So con consider lattice gauge theory, it's some given boundary condition. We'll show that the influence of the special boundary near the center is exponentially small in M if N is fixed and M going to infinity. So, so that, that will suffice. So if you take a large slab and look at something right in the center, it's not very much influenced by what's on the boundary. I mean, not, I'm not talking the top and bottom boundaries, I'm talking about the, uh, the special boundary. So that's a small boundary that's far away, okay? So this is what we want to show. So we'll, we'll show that um, uh, this, if, the, if the slab is sufficiently thick, then this, uh, this holds. So take two boundary conditions that differ only on the special boundary. So take two different boundary conditions, which are the same on the top and bottom boundaries, but differ only in the special boundary. Let mu and mu prime be the probability measures defined by these two boundary conditions. A coupling of mu and mu prime is a pair of random configurations so that omega uh, comes from mu and omega prime comes from mu prime. Uh, so what we want to do is to construct a coupling uh, so that um, for any edge near the center of the slab, uh, omega is equal to omega prime with very high probability. The chance that omega is not equal to omega e prime is exponentially small in the distance. So the, such a coupling is constructed in three steps. So first, um, we construct such a coupling similar properties in a cube instead of the slab. So you just take a cube and do that. And this is where the strong mass gap condition hold, uh, helps us. So using the strong mass gap condition and the coupling characterization of total variation distance, we can construct this measure. And for this, we need the connectedness of the gauge group. So, so we somehow need to replace each boundary condition by each boundary value by a different value. And uh, you know, we have to interpolate smoothly and so on. And so there, are, there is some work in this, but uh, with the strong mass gap, mass gap condition, we can do it in a cube instead of a slab. Okay, so then what do we do? We do this. So in a cube, what we do is show that if you have two different boundary conditions, then you can couple the measures inside so that towards the center, uh, you know, um, things are nicely coupled. So, uh, okay. So then what you do is given any coupling on the slab, we update the coupling to get a better coupling. So what we do is you, you have this slab, large slab, we choose a cube inside it, okay, uniformly at random. And then what you do is given this original coupling, we, we fix this uh, a realization of this pair outside this cube and inside we generate from the coupling that we have for the cube, okay? So we improve it inside a randomly chosen cube. And then, uh, so then what we show is that the resulting coupling is a slight improvement of the original one. We get, get some inequality showing that the resulting coupling is a slight improvement of the original one. And then we do it infinitely many times. So we choose the cube, we improve it, then choose another cube, improve it, and you keep on doing that. And, and then we can uh, get subsequential limit of this thing and obtain a coupling. Uh, and there, you know, this improvement uh, will, will give some inequality for the limit coupling that you get, subsequential limit. And that will have a parameter 
which will be less than one if the thickness of the slab is large enough. And that will imply that exponential decay holds. You can you have found a coupling for which exponential decay holds. So that you know this is how uh, you know this exponential decay in a cube can be translated to exponential decay in a in a slab uh, using this repeated improvements. Okay. Uh, so this the condition of thickness has to be large is required to ensure that certain parameter in this inequality that we obtain is strictly less than one, which leads to exponential decay. Okay, so that's about it. And here is a paper. Uh, it's on, on archive. And, uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, please, if anybody has questions, do ask. Um, Okay, so there is a, I see a chat message or something, but I cannot see that. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, Anna Thomas asks, could you summarize the other proposed explanations for quark confinement and why they are unsatisfactory? Yeah, so the other proposed uh, things are all, all from physics. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there is this thing with uh, tooth loops and Polyakov loops and, uh, uh, the physical uh, explanations. And of course, they're completely non-rigorous from a mathematical point of view. So for mathematicians, they are certainly uh, unsatisfactory because they're not rigorous. But uh, for physicists, you know, I, I don't really know. I mean, so so what's the standard of uh, proof or an uh, you know, theoretical argument that's accepted? It's not completely clear to me, but, uh, but you know, they say that it's still not, uh, still not understood why this happens. Uh, you know, one possible reason is that, uh, you know, a lot of things that underlie the, you know, these arguments is, uh, uh, is this renormalization group um, uh, idea. And renormalization group, as they do it, is a perturbative thing. And uh, perturbation theory is supposed to not be effective for, uh, for, for this area law kind of thing. And... Uh, so, so it's kind of out of the reach of uh, perturbation theory. And that, that's the main stumbling block, I think, then, because they don't have a good alternative to perturbation theory and perturbation theory cannot catch this. Yeah, so that's sort of the, but you know, I, there is some more about uh, the, uh, the physics arguments, uh, you know, Polyakov loops and all that in, in the paper, in the preprint, I have a little bit more about that. So I see Prasad here. So, I mean, you know, if I was going to compare this to something, the argument seems kind of like, a, you know, a path coupling argument where you start with some uh, local correlation condition everywhere, and then you use this to construct, the, you know, to get mixing by constructing a coupling. Yeah. Is there yeah, any? It, it has, it has these components, you know, uh, various components. So, so the first thing is this, uh, this relation that, uh, uh, you know, the area law comes because of this, that once you have a non-trivial center, uh, you can partition the space into slabs and within, even within each slab, you can, you can get this zero expectations even after conditioning because of the non-trivial center condition. And, and then, you know, then you can, and then it's, you know, it becomes clear that once you realize that it becomes clear that you have to prove some kind of exponential decay and uh, within a slab and then you know, then you just go ahead and prove that. And, uh, uh, you know, so. Um, uh, Charo, yeah. I have uh, another question. Yeah, great talk, by the way. I didn't, I knew nothing about this topic and, uh, you know, it, it made sense. So thank you. Um, I actually have a question more about the physics in a sense or mathematical way of uh, approaching this. So <clears throat> is uh, area law, pretty much the only rigorous way you see to get at confinement or could there be another way, right? So you kind of explain. Yeah, so there are, there are some other, uh, there are some other approaches, uh, but in some sense, they're all sort of similar to area law, you know? Uh, so, so there is this approach using Polyakov loops, as I said, you know, it, it also gives an exp explanation with the area law, but it's, it's similar. So, so essentially you have to, at the end of the day, you have to show that the potential between two quarks uh, is well, even if, if even if not linear, at least it's growing, so that they cannot separate beyond a certain distance. If the potential energy grows as the, as they separate further and further, then in, by conservation of energy, they cannot separate more than a certain amount. Okay, so that's that's what you have to essentially show that vr grows. Vr cannot be constant, 
And so then this quantum, you know, very basic quantum field theory calculations show that what Wilson showed that, uh, um, you know, that if you have a rectangle, the Wilson uh, loop uh, area. So, so somehow you, you kind of always return to that. Um, but, you know, there, there, are, there are some, some other approaches and there are these things called, you know, order parameters that they have, uh, which, you know, uh, indicate, but uh, uh, I, think, I think it's basically all equivalent to the Wilson loop formulation. So there are even the other, other approaches that they have. At least the argument you gave would suggest that actually any, any super perimeter law should give you confinement. Right, mm -hmm. that you didn't, you wouldn't need the area. Just yeah, that. You, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need the area. You wouldn't need the area. Although you know, you have to be careful because when you say confinement, people usually uh, take it to mean that it's a linear growth of potential. You know, in the phrases often say that. But but uh, you know, to be very precise, you uh, you don't really need to need it to grow, grow linearly. Just any kind of growth would be would be sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything, anything but better than a perimeter law. Yeah. Yeah, Professor. I may ask one more question. Uh, sure. This may be more philosophical. I don't know, but so I think you, I might have missed why it's growing like the area rather than perimeter, which certainly you know, James and some of us who work on slow mixing, etc., are used to. Like usually, it's, it, when it's slow, it's slow, and the order is like the area. Uh, sorry, the. <clears throat> the perimeter or the surface area in some sense. Yeah, so that, 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 was, that was the main insight from this proof, uh, which is that, uh, you know, you have this big loop and, mm -hmm. and then you multiply this matrix along this loop. And mm -hmm. then what you do is a condition on this boundaries between slabs. You, you, you have the slabs and this loop is going through the slabs, two strands of the loop. And you, and you separate, you partition out and then you have this, so let, me, let me get back to this, uh, to this picture here. Here. So, so you, you, you uh, partition them and then what happens is that due to the non-triviality of the center and the nature of lattice gauge theory, what you have that this conditional expectations also become zero. So, if you, so Fi and Gi are the product of group elements from the loop. So, so, so you see, so if you multiply the uh, group, uh, you know, the elements from the matrix along, let's say over here, this F3 here, okay. In general, you wouldn't expect it to have expectation zero, uh, conditional expectation, if you condition the boundaries. But the nature of lattice gauge theory ensures that that is true if the great gauge group is non trivial, uh, center is non trivial. Then, th then that expectation is, is exactly zero, which means that as soon as you can prove that there is a decay of correlations within a slab, uh, it's like e to the minus CR, then this, these, these things will be also e to the minus CR, and then you, you multiply sort of T of them. So you get e to the minus cr times t. Okay, so so that's that's the so it's very special to lattice gauge theory, and I'm sure you can formulate a more general class of models for which this is true, uh, and that would be very interesting. I think you know just from a probabilist's point of view uh, that if you if you have a general class of models where uh, this area law can be expected and can be proved, uh, that would be really nice because you know there is already this uh, you know as I mentioned this toy uh, toy model of uh, that was studied by um, uh, here, Eisenman, Chase, Chase, Froelich, and Russo. But there may be a much nicer, you know, larger class of toy models, uh, which are not quite lattice gauge theories, but which exhibit these basic features of area law and all that. So that that would be really interesting. Thank. Yeah. No, okay. Thanks again for a great talk. Thanks to all the speakers today. See some of you tomorrow. Okay. So. You guys, nice to see all of you. Yeah, good to see you, Sarah. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, it's unfortunate.